we now go to question four, the very last question on the course. It says, you mentioned that neuroscience offers us an opportunity to test and develop some of psychoanalytic ideas scientifically, and that the neuropsychoanalytic approach holds great scope for understanding and treating mental disorders. What do you think are the most important discoveries or implications that have or might in the future challenge psychoanalytic theories and ways of treating patients? Um, this is a, a big question and I can't possibly do it uh, justice um, in, 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 in this forum, but I, I want to go into a number of uh, uh, factors. First of all, a general point, um, that is that psychoanalytical treatments, like all psychological treatments, are grounded in a theoretical understanding of the mechanisms of the mind. Um, it's not just a, a, a random, arbitrary, you know, let's, let's do this and see if it helps. Uh, there's a specific way of understanding the mind, a specific th a theory or model of how the mind works and how, what the mechanisms of, of, psych of particular psychopathologies are, and the treatment is based on that understanding. For that reason, it goes without saying, as a sort of general principle, that to the extent that your theoretical understanding of how the mind works in health and in disease um, is incomplete or incorrect, to that extent uh, your, your, your treatment based on that understanding is going to be um, Im Im impaired or impeded. It's, it's going to be limited, commensurate with the, with the mistakes in, in your understanding. So therefore, um, in principle, advances in understanding how the mind really works must must have implications for how we treat the disorders of the mind. Now, uh, neuropsychoanalysis has been around, depending on how you um, define it, um, it's been around probably something like 15 years. Uh, certainly that's when the journal came out, the Neuropsychoanalytic Society, uh, 16 years old. Um, at the most generous um, uh, d uh, definition of when neuropsychoanalysis came into being, um, it's, it's 25 or 30 years old. Now that's not a long time in science, 15 to 30 years. So I don't think it's surprising that there have not yet been many major um, discoveries that have had direct and obvious uh, consequences for psychoanalytical therapy, but there have been some. Um, and let me quickly run through the big ticket items. Firstly, the uh, psychoanalytical theory, at least uh, there are many psychoanalytical theories, but they all ultimately um, are grounded in Freudian theory. Um, to the extent that we've made advances uh, in the understanding of drives and instincts, um, it, it, uh, to that extent uh, we have um, uh, made discoveries which have major implications for all psychoanalytical theory, uh, in, insofar as they um, are, are grounded in, in Freudian ideas. Freud had very specific ideas about the instincts or drives that are operant in the human mind. Uh, he wrote his famous Instincts and Their Vicissitudes uh, in 1915. He wrote another famous uh, uh, paper called Beyond the Pleasure Principle in 1920 in which he revised this theory. But he always, he said, we have to have a theory of drives and instincts because this is the, these are the basic motivational forces of the mind. But he also conceded that um, you know, he's, he was very uncertain about um, the accuracy of the theories that, or, or the classifications that he had come up with. Because for Freud, that turned out to be the main thing. What, how are we to um, clump together the various component instincts and drives into broader categories? Um, how do we classify and taxonomize the, inst the instincts and the drives? We've made enormous advances in this area um, since Freud died, and especially in the last 20 years, we've learned an enormous amount. Um, and we now um, uh, generally agreed in um, the neurosciences, especially in the part called affective neuroscience, that there are multiple instincts um, and multiple drives um, operant in the human mind. And uh, the, this inevitably has consequences for our therapy. Um, if you think that the basic uh, structure of the mind is a conflict between self-preservative and se sexual instincts, as Freud originally thought, or as he later thought that it's a conflict between destructive and, uh, and um, 
and, and constructive or, or, or life-enhancing forces, um, you're going to do very different things. You're going to conceptualize the disorders of the mind very differently than if you think, as we do today, that there are a multiplicity of them. Uh, there's, a, there's a foraging drive, there's a sexual drive, there's a, there's a, a, a fear instinct, uh, there's a separation distress instinct, and these things are entirely independent of each other. There's even a play instinct. Uh, there's a nurturance instinct. And uh, these, 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 the, uh, the, um, the innate sensitivities of these systems and the ways that they're sensitized in early, um, in early uh, development and the way that they are synthesized with each other because they frequently conflict uh, and contradict each other. Uh, for example, rage towards a frustrating parent and attachment bonding to that same frustrating parent. How do you reconcile these things with each other? So the mind is, uh, develops. What, what, what Freudians call the ego, uh, develops in, um, in, re in response to these, what Freud called id demands. And to the extent that we have a much better understanding of the structure of these id demands, uh, to that extent we have a much better understanding of what the tasks are that the ego, what the conflicts are that the ego has to contend with. And this has massive implications. Just think of what I said earlier, for example, about depression and panic. Um, this is, uh, you know, these are ubiquitous disorders. The fact that, uh, that the anxiety felt in obsessive compulsive disorder is of a panic type, um, you know, the, the, this has obvious uh, implications for the way we conceptualize these, these, these patients and therefore the way that we treat them. So the taxonomy of the instincts and the drives is the first huge change um, which has implications for, the, for, for what we do uh, in therapy. Um, then there's the fact that um, the the, what I mentioned in relation to question one, that affects are conscious. Um, ideas uh, or thoughts uh, can, can be, and for the most part, are unconscious. Um, the instinctual functions that I've been speaking about in the brain arise from the same parts of the brain as consciousness arises from. So whereas Freud thought that instincts were at the core of the unconscious, uh, this is simply uh, 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 undoubtedly wrong, uh, that the, the instinctual part of the brain is conscious. And that means that these, uh, the deepest motivating forces at work in the mind are felt by the patient. They are not unconscious. Um, this has, again, as you can imagine, massive implications for therapy because it's a complete turning on its head um, of the basic psychoanalytical model. Um, I, I've uh, written a paper which is uh, available, as I've said before, um, open access uh, on the web. Uh, just Google Mark Solms, the conscious id, um, and then you'll see um, a fuller explication of all of this. Um, the, the id, as Freud called it, is conscious, uh, and the ego, as Freud called it, is for the most part or, or intrinsically unconscious and seeking to be unconscious, which is the exact... Uh, uh, opposite um, of what Freud claimed. This, as I say, can only but have massive implications for our therapy. I'll just give you the smallest hint um, of what I'm talking about, which is that um, our patients, when they come to treatment, they don't say, uh, doctor, I I'm unconscious of something, can you please tell me what it is? They come and say, I have this feeling, can you please make it go away? Uh, our patients suffer from feelings. Um, and the, 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 the task of the ego is to manage these consciously felt uh, id, instinctual uh, uh, drive forces. Uh, so it's a, a completely different way of conceptualizing what you're doing. You're trying to help the patient to become more unconscious. Um, I, I, in this forum, as I say, I can't begin to unpack uh, the, the full meaning of this. Um, and do please read uh, that paper. Um, but... The, the, again, just to put a little bit of uh, clinical flesh on, on, the, on the bones uh, of what I've just said, and really I'm just saying this for illustrative purposes, um, what we conceptualize as counter-transference, uh, that the patient comes into the room um, and the, the, the analyst uh, picks up something, um, uh, uh, feels something um, that uh, they don't normally feel, and uh, they use the understanding of what they're feeling um, as a basis for understanding what's going on in the patient. Uh, the Freud would have conceptualized and did conceptualize this as there's some sort of spooky way in which the, 
the, the unconscious of the patient and the unconscious of the analyst are in direct communication with each other, uh, you know, and uh, how the hell does that happen? As I say, it's spooky. Uh, I would say, on the basis of the concepts that I've just outlined, that in fact uh, what's going on is nothing unconscious at all. It's the fact that the patient has the affects, they're, they're consciously there in the room. The patient just doesn't know why they're having the affects. That's, that's uh, the, 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 the uh, analytical question and the analytical task is to discover what explains these feelings. So what we think of as counter-transference is, in many, many cases, it's just the, the analyst picking up the feelings that the patient is displaying. Um, and the, the, the task then is, how do, we, how do we explain the presence of these feelings? What are these feelings all about? Um, what problem do these feelings uh, represent uh, that the patient doesn't have ideas um, or thoughts um, to meet? They, they, no, they, they don't have... Uh, uh, ways of uh, uh, representing, ways of ideationally managing these particular feelings. So these are just really very broad brushstroke examples, pointers towards um, the ways in which analytical techniques um, are being changed, are beginning to be changed by um, advances in uh, our knowledge of how the mind works derived from neuropsychoanalytical research. So, uh, with that kind of um, in, uh, uh, pointing towards the future, um, uh, indicating the vistas uh, on the horizon, the, the promised land, uh, that seems like an apt way to end um, the, this session and this course. Thank you so much for your interest and for your participation. Bye-bye.